Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit and in the finished work of Christ who redeemed me with his life. Grateful for the opportunity that you continue to give us to do what we're doing here at BlessedHopeForever.com. I just ask that you filter out the error, but seal to our hungry hearts the truth of your word. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We've been studying together in the epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we were in the area of verses 11 and 12 of chapter 10. After being shown the hard reality of divine election in chapter 9, we are now seeing the Holy Spirit's desire for Israel, God's chosen people, that they might be saved, a desire which includes you and me. And if anyone ever wanted a testimony to the divine authorship of Scripture, the progression or the arrangement of these chapters alone proves it to have been authored by God the Holy Spirit. Man could not have arranged these chapters the way that, that we're looking at them. That Paul just held the pen. And when we got to the ninth and the tenth verses, we got to the simple statement that there isn't anything difficult in this salvation because the word is near you, even in your mouth, confessing, that is saying the same thing that God says, and believing. And I pointed out that in the 18th chapter of Acts, seeing that Paul was considering ministry in Corinth. God said, don't worry about any problems there. I have many people in that city. And if you were the missionary and you already knew that God's people were in that city, you surely wouldn't be spending your time trying to make them God's people. You would be spending your effort and your time bringing God's people the message of God's word that he had redeemed them, that they were new creations in Christ, and that the concern is for their salvation. And then I pointed out how that the whoever that calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Actually, the word is ponta in the Greek. It's all, all, that is all of God's people in verse 13, has to be those whom God redeemed through the finished work of Christ. Even though the modern Christian thought is that saved means redemption, which it does not mean in this particular context. Whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord will be redeemed contradicts the message given through John that we're born from above by the will of God and that by being born from above by the will of God, we believe and we won't perish but have everlasting life and that the reason this is true is because we are his sheep so the process of evangelism is not making goats sheep of which there is no biblical picture but it is in fact bringing the sheep the good news of his word and once we see that well then we don't have any problem with these texts. The modern thought is that if you call upon the name of the Lord, you'll go to heaven. And yet to believe that, one has to throw out the first few chapters of Romans to, uh, as a starter and a ton of other scripture. Since, first of all, man is spiritually dead and must be quickened to life before he can call on or believe God and, and secondly no man seeks after God scripture says that we are redeemed made righteous by the obedience of Christ and there was no synergism or cooperation in that 
There was no synergism in birth. I don't know how many times I've been told, Steve, you have to receive it. For as many as received him, to which I have to reply, God's elect cannot decide whether or not to accept being one of God's elect. When your mother and dad decided to have a child and you were born, you received life. And there wasn't any synergism in that. You received it because you were born. It isn't that you had any choice as to whether, whether or not that you would accept life. However, there is a choice in whether you will accept the deliverance that has been provided for you in Christ. If you don't accept it, you won't find a single verse that suggests you'd go to hell for not accepting it. In fact, Bema, the, the judgment seat of Christ, the, the hay, wood, and stubble uh, contrasted with the gold, silver, and precious stones, confirms the fact that that's not the case. If you don't accept it, you won't find a single verse that suggests you'd go to hell for not accepting it. But there is a lot of scripture that would suggest that you don't have much rest and peace and joy. We then saw here that with the center of the being, man believes toward the righteousness that's provided in Christ. Many are of the persuasion that because you believe you are made righteous and there is no scripture for that. In that verse, the word unto is ice in the Greek, for with the heart man believes into that righteousness which is provided in Christ Jesus. You are made righteous because of his obedience, not because you believed, but now that you who are righteous believe, you are, uh, if, if you believe that you've, you've been made righteous, then you're delivered from a whole lot of problems. For the scripture says, whoever, all who believe on him will not be put to shame. And that's about where we were in our last study. Folks, imagine believing something zealously. Verse 2. Spending your money, your time, and your effort preaching what you believe just to wind up before the throne of the Almighty Eternal God and find out you were totally wrong. That everything that you thought, everything you believed, everything you worked for, everything you strived for was in fact error. I think that'd be a terrible shame. Verse 11. However, if you believe into Christ, into Christ, you, you will not be put to shame. And the word shame is the same word found in our not being ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. And in the 12th verse, there's no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. It's the same Lord who is rich unto all those who call upon him. For a Gentile to be in fellowship with the Lord in the Old Testament, he had to go through a Jewish priest. However, provision was always made in Christ, and that's why we read in, in Habakkuk, the justified man, the man who is made righteous, will live by God's faithfulness. And that was always true, both in the Old and the New Covenant. There is no distinction. It's the same Lord. There isn't a separate Jesus for Peter than, than there was for Paul. There's a lot of uh, Bible teaching today that says because of that verse that, that Peter, James, and John would go to the Jew and Paul would go to the Gentiles and that they came with a different message. It wasn't the message that was different. It was the people that were different, but the, the message was the same. So I don't believe that there's a shred of truth in that. I don't believe Peter preached a different message than Paul. Peter was a little bit confused. Even as our beloved brother Paul has written in his epistles things hard to be understood. 
you know, they must have been rough for Peter, considering the environment in which he'd been raised. But don't forget that Paul was raised in that in environment too, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and, and what a dramatic change came in his life as the Lord revealed himself to him. There is no distinction. It's the same Lord. So all those who are redeemed, who call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved, delivered. It does not say all those who are goats or tear, who, who are spiritually dead, who do not seek after God, who call upon the name of the Lord, will be redeemed, and yet that's the modern message preached today. And it's as false as my grandpa's top and bottom false teeth. The word called is an aorist, and that word saved is a future tense. I believe it to be saying that when you call upon the name of the Lord, that call represents your understanding of your righteousness, your understanding of your forgiveness, the forgiveness of sin, and so forth. I may be wrong, but, but think about this verse for a moment. If that were a present tense, then it, it would be saying, uh, it, well, it would be something that we would continue doing repeatedly. On the other hand, it's an heiress tense, and therefore, in the word call, call upon, is the Greek preposition for upon, and the heiress tense means a one-time thing. It's a point in time, rather than a process in time, or a process through time. Therefore, I believe the word call upon is an, is an understanding, uh, once for all, understanding of the concept of who Christ is and what Christ has done. I see in the text that there is an all who belong to God, and I believe with all of my heart that he has a family who is his own. As he said of, of Corinth, I have many people in that city. They're his people. Reminds me of the, the Christmas season, Matthew one twenty one, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Right there is one of the best definitions, biblically, of salvation. It's deliverance from sin, but it's his people. They didn't become his people by anything they did. He came to deliver those who are already his people from their sins. And somehow or another, we've turned it upside down and we've suggested that it's the individual who decides whether or not he's God's people. And it simply doesn't fit the biblical picture. Christ came for his people. The biblical picture is Christ rescuing his sheep who have gone astray. Not going out and finding a goat and turning him into a sheep like he turned water into wine. That is not the picture, folks. We have to stay with the picture. And the picture, the overall picture, is presented in the text, in the Word of God, in so many chapters and in so many verses. They were already his people, and so all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's what we're looking at here in this text. In realizing, saved, it, it, as in realizing you are God's child, that he has provided for you, that he's made you righteous, that you've been delivered from sin, delivered from the law, delivered from worry or fear of death and a thousand other things. And that's I don't, not as much the fear of physical dying. I believe it is much more intense than that, that God has delivered us from the fear of that judgment which follows death. I can't tell you how many Christians, folks, that I, I talk to who are afraid of judgment. You know, there's a payday someday, and, and I'm going to stand and give an account for all of my sins. Well, what did Christ do then? What kind of a God do I see in this book? 
I see folks a God who has nothing against us not a not a loving Heavenly Father who would hold Christ accountable for your sin and then hold you accountable for it as well that's I guess what we call double jeopardy he's not gonna do that I've, I've had people tell me you know Steve Christ forgave my sins up to the time that I accepted him but I'm not so sure about you know my sins now and folks that shouldn't take a rocket scientist to realize that every sin that you committed was future when Christ died he has forgiven you all sins all trespasses you stand before him holy unblameable and unreprovable in his sight and you need to know that that is part and parcel of the salvation we're looking at in this text and all who understand that who are calling upon him and believing in him are not ashamed Ephesians 2 8 and 9 you all know the verse for by grace you you are saved through faith and that not of yourselves it's a gift of God not a works lest any man should boast and then the next verse the next verse for we are his workmanship created in Christ for good works which God has foreordained that we should walk in them don't miss that which God has foreordained how, how do you do that it's the finished work of Christ folks that we should walk in them what good works ours no no a thousand times no no we walk in the finished work of Christ we walk realizing that it's what Christ has done we're not walking in our production our performance our good works but in his so those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved how then shall they call how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher uh, the Holy Spirit is drawing from some verses in Isaiah and Joel how can they call on him and the word call on is, is the same Greek word in verse 13 and the word in him is is not is not in it is ice into reminds me of John 14 where Jesus said uh, you believe in God please believe also into me go back and look at that John 14 I've had people say to me why should we then bother preaching the gospel if God does the choosing in the text here is saying that there's a reason for evangelizing there's a reason for going out and that is for God's people but how are they going to call on him if they haven't believed not that they're not redeemed because they are but they haven't exercised belief towards salvation and how shall they exercise that belief in him in whom they've not heard it's always been my opinion my personal opinion and I've gotten in a lot of trouble over this is that many people will be in glory who never heard of Christ in their human lifetime and I believe it will be quite a multitude and how shall they hear without a preacher it is not trying to make sheep out of goats it is not trying to make weed out of tear it is presenting the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ to God's people whether they be Israel or non Israel the chapter started out my heart's desire my heart's longing for Israel is that they might be redeemed no saved now we have the same Lord overall both Jew and non-Jew and they can call upon him if they don't believe 
and they can't believe what he, he's done unless someone tells them about it. We need preaching. You got to have somebody proclaim it. But, folks, if you're, if you're going to go to the missionary field or start a YouTube channel or go out on the street and preach, if you're going to go to the missionary field to convert goats into wheat or, or into sheep, don't go. But if you're going because you love the Lord and you want to proclaim the marvelous finished work of Christ to those who haven't heard, to his people who have not heard, then by all means, go. I recognize that the Holy Spirit can, can send a person alone. But what I see in the Word of God, Paul and Barnabas were sent by the church. And they wound up teaching in Antioch. The church had sent them and, and, and they had accomplished what God had, had intended for them to do. So these are sent. As, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Note the word peace. And bring, and bring glad tidings of good things. And of course, we know that's a quote from Isaiah chapter 52. What a wonderful thing to preach the good news of the peace of God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, having been justified by the faithfulness of Christ, we have peace with God. One of the great difficulties I find are those who may not even be sure that they're, they're Christian. They don't have peace. Folks, God's children ought to have peace, and, and the peace of God is a peace that passes understanding. It's the peace of God in which we can stand. You're not going to face judgment. You're not going to face condemnation. You don't have a loving Heavenly Father who takes joy in your suffering, who sits up there, you know, and, and schemes to make life difficult for you. I've heard people say, you know, growing old is, is not for sissies. And I say growing old just it heightens my desire for glory. There is nothing in this life that holds any longing for me. What a wonderful thought being with the Lord. He loves you, folks. He loves you. God Almighty has never, ever touched you except in love. Not one thing has ever entered your life that didn't go through the counsel of the Almighty, eternal God who created the heavens and the earth and determined that it was best for you in every situation. I ought to know that peace. How shall they preach except they be sent? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. That's what it is. It's good news of peace. It isn't some kind of news of what you ought to do and, and that's, that's the way it's normally preached. I don't know how many articles that I have here in my study on, on what must I do to be saved. I collected a whole bunch of things on that. You know, you have to accept Christ. You have to have a personal relationship with Christ. You have to, to share your faith. You have to be baptized. You have to pray. You have to repent. And, and it goes on and on and on. These aren't conditional aspects, uh, characteristics. These aren't, these aren't things one must do in order to be, become something. They're things that we do because we have become something. Modern Christianity has reversed it. Dearly beloved, I have good news for you. You have peace with God. And that peace with God is not based upon any 
single thing, not one thing in you. It is all in Christ. The more we detract from that, the less we understand what Christ has done. And the more we become confused with what we must do. The good news isn't what you have to do, what you should do, or what you should have done. The good news is you have peace with God. There's no judgment for you who are in Christ. And all of a sudden, falling face down in horse manure, well, becomes insignificant. I don't know, you know, my own personal experience, you know, the, the tangled wires and the, and the lost tools, and, you know, whatever it might be, a truck that doesn't run, a truck that doesn't start, you know, a thousand and one things, and yet I have peace with God. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news of peace. And let me tell you, in watching television or listening to radio or, or YouTube or just browsing the internet, I don't hear that very much. You have peace with God because you have been justified by the finished work of Jesus Christ. Nothing you do. And our text goes on to say and bring glad tidings of good things. It's not good things to tell me how much I've sinned and how much I shouldn't have done that and how much I have to do, you know, to make it right. All of a sudden, without hope, I find out that God Almighty has paid my debt. That I am his child. And more than that, that I always was his child. That I was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. I'm alarmed at, at how many Christians think that, you know, that there are there are, you know there are super children of God whom he treats very nice, and then there are children of God who, you know, who are naughty and not very nice and and so we don't treat them very well. And folks, if we're fair with the word of God, every one of God's children has value to him. An immense value. A value that we can't describe. A value that equals the finished work of Christ. Whoever you are, Whatever you do, however you live, the price that he paid for you is infinite. And I don't believe that he will leave you nor forsake you. I don't understand all the problems of human life, the things that, that tend to roll over us like waves of the sea. I don't profess to understand them. But what I do understand is that I am in the hands, and you are in the hands of a loving Heavenly Father who promises that He will never ever leave you or fail to sustain and uphold you. He knows who you are, and He knows what's best for you. I gather from the, from the Scriptures that when our God says He knows what's best for me, well, he's basically inferring that I don't. And I'm glad. I'm glad that the sovereign monarch of eternity knows what's best for me. Because I surely don't. If you just look at the Christian community, it's uh, almost overwhelming. Virtually every marriage is a wrong marriage. And... And no child seems to obey or, or grow up right. No job works out right. I've actually had Christians tell me that, you know, apparently God doesn't work anything right in their life. What a terrible thing to say. Oh, dearly beloved. From the living God, 
what he brings to you is good news of peace and tidings of good things. What I believe is that right here in this in the present text in which the, which we've been looking at, I believe that that here we've been looking at God's desire, His heart, expressed through His people for His people for their deliverance, which is nothing less than my desire for you all. As well. I love you dearly. This is Steve. Thank you for watching.